Hey, I'm Zelda. Welcome to Drop Up, a podcast to inspire rebels from all backgrounds to pursue their hero's journey. In today's episode, meet Tallinn, a program pioneer, game designer, and artist. Tallinn learned how to code in the Air Force back in the 70s before moving to Los Angeles to join the hacker movement of the 80s and create his own video game company, the Dreamers Guild. Among his numerous achievements, Tallinn also worked on the Sims, at Amazon and Google as a senior software engineer. We had a profound and intimate discussion on his life story and, among other things, healing from depression. A big thank you to the 1517 Fund, they back thousands of hackers, entrepreneurs, dropouts and renegades like us for being the sponsor of these conversations. Enjoy. Ready? Cool. Tallinn, if we were to tell the story of your life, starting with once upon a time, uh-huh. where would we start and what would we say? Um, let me think about that. So I was always a, a kid who had a lot of talent, right? I had Uh, and when I say a lot of talent, it wasn't like I was great at any particular thing, but I had, you know, I could draw, I could do music, I took organ lessons. And everybody always told me, well, you've got to stick to one thing, right? You've got to focus on one thing because then you'll, otherwise you'll never be successful. You'll just be a dilettante, right? And I just couldn't. Uh, I couldn't. Um, it was hard for me to just focus on, let's say, art because... Those are the things they call to you, right? It's like, no, don't abandon me, right? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, uh, so eventually when I got out of uh, high school and I had a career in the Air Force for a while, but afterwards I thought, well, maybe there's a job that involves doing many different things. And at first, I thought that the job would be like a special effects technician in Hollywood, but that didn't work very out very well. But in the meantime, I was fooling around with computers and writing little games. And so I kind of accidentally fell into becoming a game developer. And as a game developer, I realized I could do music and I could do art and I could do code and all of those things. And so it And for the first time in my life, it felt like I was really just firing on all cylinders, like the, the engine was really running, right? So it sounds like your, your life story is really imprinted in doing a lot of different things, um, being very creative in a lot of mm -hmm. fields. Um, and so what young Tallinn was, was dreaming of at the time, was it something you, you thought you would be able to do one day to create without limits and um, be free to follow whatever sure. calling you had? Well, I knew that I wanted to be creative. In fact, I'm a kind of a person who's kind of compulsively creative, right? Um, I'm not happy unless I'm building something. Even when I was a little kid, you know, uh, the thing that gave me joy was to take two pieces of wood and a hammer and a nails and knock something together. But I What I didn't know at the time was what kind of person that is. You know, people would ask, what do you want to be? And I say, I don't know. I know what I like to do, but I don't know what kind of a person is allowed to do those things. <laughs> okay. It's often the case when you become a teenager that um, you're, you're, look, you're seeking for an identity, right? You're mm -hmm. seeking to define yourself. Mm -hmm. So can you tell me more about that time and how it might have led you to join the Air Force, as you mentioned. Yep. And what, what it, did it look like? Also, because we're two different generations, so I'm, I'm very curious what, what it was like to be at school for you. Well, school was hell, right? Uh, school was, you know, I was going through depression at the time. I had um, been medicated, uh, well, as a child with Ritalin because of They didn't call it ADHD back then. They called it uh, hyperactive disorder. Mm. And then uh, the withdrawal, one of the withdrawal symptoms of Ritalin is years of depression, right? Uh, fairly common. And so I was sad most of the time and didn't realize that I was sad, okay? 
I was also a geek, right? Uh, and and back that time, that was before the word geek was a a, a, yeah. a term of pride, right? Geek geek was almost as bad as being called a fag, right? Mm. You know, back then it was like one of the worst insults that you could name. So I didn't really have. I had a couple of people I hung out with at school. Um, they weren't friends in the normal sense, you know. They weren't friends in the sense of people that you could call up and tell your troubles to, but there were people with you could hang out with and um it actually wasn't until i joined the air force and found discovered science fiction fandom that i realized that there were other people in the world like me wow that's something big and i think that's something that a, like not all of teenagers, but probably many teenagers feel at that age, I'm alone. And probably yep. this changed a lot with, from my generation on, thanks to the internet, we're f like figuring out that there is other people like us, whatever we're into uh, pretty early on. But yeah, I think this is something. I, I really crazy. felt like I had been born on the wrong planet. Mm. Like I was an alien in the middle of humans, mm. you know? Yeah. Um, and, and there was no one that I could really explain. It was like no one understood the things that I was thinking about, Yeah. right? Uh, at the same time, I was blind to a lot of things. I didn't really understand other people's needs and feelings, right? I didn't understand empathy. Uh, those were things I had to learn, you know, which I learned much later. Um, but I will tell you that the two most valuable things I learned in the Air Force were uh, science fiction fandom and Dungeons and Dragons. <laughs> That's pretty uncommon <laughs> for an experience in the Air Force. I imagine not knowing much about the Air Force. Can you tell us what what were you do? Like, how did you end up in the first place? So it was my mother's idea that I should join the military. Right? Uh -huh. I never wanted to, yeah. but at the, I'd gotten out of high school and I had, I had no training. I had I was trained for nothing. Right? I I had no job skills. Uh, I like to mess around with electronics, and but I didn't have an electronics degree. Uh, so my mom decided, no, you're going to join the military. And the Air Force was the only one that would take me uh, because I was skinny and weak and, and a little bit weird. Uh, and luckily, I passed their uh, aptitude tests and got assigned a job as a programmer. So right. that's how I learned to code. Uh, I mean, I'd done a little bit of coding in high school, but but... Uh, so they sent me to, uh, after uh, basic training, which is marching around and, you know, saluting and all that stuff. That was four weeks, although it took me more like eight weeks because I kept getting demoted and set back. Mm. Um, I almost washed out, right? But I pleaded with the commanding officer to let me keep going and I, and, and he yeah. took pity on me. And so I, I, I made it through. Once I got into technical training school in Biloxi, Mississippi, mm -hmm. and I met some people there who were, you know, programmers and, and we started hanging out and... I was very fortunate. A lot of people today, when they learn programming, they learn a language like Python or Java, and that's all they know, right? And they don't really understand how the computer works, mm. right? They just know, oh, if I make these lines of code, it'll do this thing. When I learned in the Air Force, the first thing they taught you was hexadecimal math, right? And then binary, yeah. and then machine code. Mm. And then finally, on, once you've learned that, they, I, then they taught Fortran, and then after that, COBOL. Right. So it learned from the bottom up. Wow. Right. You know, from from the very lowest level of the machine. Mm -hmm. And so at each point you understood what was going on beneath, mm -hmm. you know, the the level at which you were working. Now, the machine that they had there was a Hughes. Now, Hughes doesn't make computers anymore. They, they made mainframes. And the mainframe that we used was serial number 0001. Uh, and this was an old mainframe that was used for the flight control training simulators. So they had this big room full of like, you know, when you're in a flight control room, there's a lot of these radar displays. Right. Well, these were all simulators for training the flight controllers. Mm. And it was hooked up to this computer that drove them. But when the tr classes were not being held, then the computer programming class would come in and use the computer to, to, un to learn programming. Mm. And what, what was the years? This was uh, 1976. All right. And when you joined the Air Force and started to study programming, did you, did it feel like, uh, so you had to leave your parents' home? Mm -hmm. 
did it feel like this this change of environment helpful for your depression finding yourself kind of finding your path did it feel that way it was like i had been teleported to another planet another one <laughs> yes exactly right yeah right i mean the sense of um this sense of of being on my own and sort of like even though i was under orders and and restricted at the same time there was this sense of freedom right mm. that you know i was i was disconnected from the apron strings and and mm. so on and so forth uh this is also a period where i started to really rethink the whole idea of religion right so you know i grew up in a very conservative catholic church right went to mass in an adobe uh, church every day uh, this was El, uh, San Juan Capistrano down in down in uh, Orange County uh, is where I went to school. But I never really believed it, right? And yet I felt guilty for not believing it. Okay, it, there was a lot of things that just didn't make sense to me. I mean, just illogical, some stuff that was morally inconsistent, right? It was like, why are the people who say God is love, God is love, are the most mean spirited, right? <laughs> so um, when I was in the Air Force. Uh, in in uh, tech school, they had church services. And one day I woke up late and I missed the Catholic church service, but they had the Protestant church service in the same building. And so I thought, well, I'll just make it up. And I noticed the Protestant service was very different. And, uh, you know, there was lots of singing and shouting. And this, this sounds a lot more fun than the Catholic service, right? Yeah. And, and so... And I thought about that. And after a few weeks, I, 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 didn't, I didn't become a Protestant. But what crystallized for me, because uh, I, I was always afraid I was going to go to hell, right? Mm. You know, that was what they told you. If you don't believe everything, you're going to roast in fire forever. That, mm. that, was the, that was the story they told. And then I started to think, well, what if this was just a story? Yeah. What if this was just something somebody made up? Mm. And I found this profound sense of relief, mm. right? Maybe I'm not going to burn in flames forever, right? Wouldn't, wouldn't that be wonderful, right? <laughs> Right. And this makes me think of your whole um, path into building multiple video mm -hmm. games mm -hmm. and how you developed your ability to write stories within those games. And so I imagine that not only it might have been a relief, but also in a way to realize someone might have written the stories mm -hmm. and pose you that maybe you can write stories too. Yes. What do you think about well, that? Let, one of the things that I learned that, remember I said one of the most valuable things I learned is Dungeons and Dragons. Mm -hmm. Before that, I was a very narrowly focused individual. I liked electronics and electronic music and technical stuff, right? Mm -hmm. But I didn't know anything about history or geography. You know, I've never really paid attention to any of those things. Mm -hmm. But in those days, when you played Dungeons and Dragons, you know, you had the little brown books, the the, the original, which I still have over there, right? Yeah. Um, a lot of the game was incomplete, right? Mm. It wasn't like today where everything is handed to you on a platter. You had to make up a lot of stuff, right? And so I started to get interested in medieval weaponry mm. and the history of, you know, European conquest and theology because you have gods and goddesses and religions. And I, and I, this, this, so I gradually became broader and broader of interests. And this led me, after I got out of the Air Force, I went to college for a few years, two years on the GI Bill. Mm -hmm. So the, the, the government paid for my education, right? Mm -hmm. And one of the things I decided is, you know, I already know programming, so I'm not going to take any computer science courses. And the community college that I went to didn't have a good computer science course. Yeah. I'm going to take courses on things that I don't know. Wonderful. Right? right? This was the best decision in my life, right? You know, you cultural anthropology and creative writing and European humanities. Wow. Okay. Yeah. And so having this br opening up and getting that breadth, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And then, as you say, this provided fodder for the creativity, all this information about history and culture, and that fed into the creativity of building these stories for games, right? What came next after the Air Force and going to college? You founded, you, was it the time where you founded your first company? Uh, so not quite yet. That was, that's, that's a few years in the future. Oh. So first I tried to work as a contractor. I, I found there was a small uh, computer shop called State Art Systems 
uh, in my neighborhood. And I started doing like, even while I was going to school, I started doing a little bit of paid work for them, yeah. but they were kind of shady and kind of, uh, I can tell you stories about how they tricked their customers and did all kinds of, you know, uh, uh, things. But, um, mm-hmm. then I, like I say, I moved up to LA, uh, mm-hmm. looking for work and, um, I got a job at a uh, computer games company called Datasoft, mm-hmm. right? And I was working, I wasn't actually working on games right away. I was working on um, doing a little word processor for the Radio Shack color computer. Uh, that company went bankrupt after about a year. And so this is now about 1985, uh-huh. okay? And I had made friends while I was at Datasoft. And there was this new computer coming out called the Amiga, which we, we talked about a little mm-hmm. bit. Uh, it was the first computer to have a high resolution, multicolor, many color display uh, with multitasking because, you know, the Apple and the, the PC didn't multitask at that time. Mm. Right. Uh, and so I used to hang around in the computer store. Right. There was a computer store called KJ Computers up in Northridge uh, in the San Fernando Valley where me and my friends used to hang out. And the Amiga had just arrived and everybody was excited and... Uh, this new this new computer, this new piece of hardware. Mm-hmm. And the guy who owned the store said, hey, listen, we, can you help us out? Um, we t- we're told that this computer can talk, but we haven't figured out how to get it to talk. You know, it's got a speech synthesizer, <laughs> right? Yeah. I said, okay, well, give me the manual. Mm-hmm. Got the manual, open it up. Oh, there's a speak command, blah, blah, blah. Give me about 30 minutes. So I wrote a little program in basic. You could type in your words, it would speak it. And they were like really impressed, right? <laughs> And they said, look, I'll sell this. Let me, I'll, I'm going to sell this program and I'll give you half the money, right? Mm. He sold about, you know, 20 copies mm. for 30 bucks each. So I got a little bit, you know, I wasn't working. So I, I was I was actually at that time sleeping in the corner, in a sleeping bag on the corner of a friend's house, right? Wow, right. And, mm. and by the way, I want to give you a, a slight digression. Mm-hmm. Many people say that I'm kind of a self-made man, that I, you know, I have talent, that I work my way up. But what they don't understand is that every step of the way there were gatekeepers mm-hmm. right people who could have stopped me who could have gotten in my way and but who didn't who who let me have the opportunities and chance that i needed take that for example sleeping in a sleeping bag mm-hmm. i knew that no matter what happened to me i would never be homeless mm-hmm. i would never be on the street right Even though I had to sleep on couches, I had couches to sleep on, right? There were people who would let me stay in their house. And that meant that I could pick the job I wanted rather than being forced to take the the first job that came along, right? And so what I realized is that if I had been born a different gender or a different race, those gatekeepers might not have been open for me, right? Right. Absolutely. Yeah. I think it's a wonderful digression. Thank you. The self-made concept, I feel like is used a lot um, in all kinds of ways and is a beautiful way to narrate one story. But in fact, as you say, there is so many, so many ways in which we're helped throughout building or crafting our path. Yep. Right. And that's what privilege looks like. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Having a couch to sleep on is what privilege looks like. 100%. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, coming back to, to those different jobs, do you remember what, what you were thinking? So, like, you were sleeping on your friend's couch yep. or in a sleeping bag. Yep. And you were, were you figuring out what was your next step? What, what was your, like mental process at the time with with your path with maybe building a career um what were you thinking of at the time i wasn't trying to build a career i was just really interested in technology okay Okay. and and one of the things i noticed at that time is that the best programmers that i knew were very playful right Mm. and that they like to play right and that they learn through playing Right. Oh, there's a new computer. What does this do? Oh, what is that command? That's fun. Let's try this. Right. Mm. Um, and whereas the the people who were like, well, I just got to get my job done, and I'm not gonna, I'm gonna focus. We're not, we're not the high productivity people. Right. Yeah. They they were not the highest productivity. So after I finished the little talk to me program, the the uh, the owner of the computer store said, listen, I want you to write a game 
I'm going to give you a computer. I'm going to give you some money to, to live off of. And I want it to be just like Cave of the Word Wizard on the C64. So he showed me a demo of this little educational game. I said, okay, I can do that. Uh, so he got, I got an art program, started drawing the characters. I, I had done, my father and I had done um, stop motion animation back when I was a little kid, mm. right? We had made these little, like South Park, right? These little cardboard construction paper characters with a camera where you would climb up on the ladder and click and then move. So I knew the basics of animation, mm. right? And so uh, I did the animation. I, I, the music, I had to write a music editor to make the music, uh -huh. okay? And so the game I came up with is called Discovery. And uh, I, it was on the shelf over there with, or when I was showing you the games earlier, but uh, it was a little, I decided instead of making it a cave, I didn't want to just copy somebody else's game. Mm -hmm. So it's a crash spaceship. So the spaceship has corridors and there's these barriers and there's a little boy lost in the spaceship and he has to repair it. But he, every time he comes up to the barrier, the computer says, spell carpet, right? <laughs> Using the, the speech synthesizer, right? Mm -hmm. Or spell mononucleosis right mm. uh so so you had to type in the word and then it would let you go it was a it was a little spelling quiz right mm. and so we started selling that and after the first year i got a royalty check for twenty thousand dollars which is more money than i'd ever have in my life yeah right and so uh that took four months mm -hmm. uh so jim the owner of the store said okay we're gonna found a new company we're gonna split off a publisher we're gonna call it micro illusions you're gonna work for me under contract. And that's where uh, Wolf McNally and Rikar, um, Key, that you know, mm -hmm. all started uh, doing games for Micro Illusions, this, which was started by this fellow, Jim. Uh, so he said, what do you wanna do next? And he was asking me, and I said, well, I've had this idea for a game based on fairy tales, right? Uh, Cause we've got, you know, high fantasy like Tolkien and we've got swords and sorcery like Conan the Barbarian, mm -hmm. but one, genre that has not been explored yet mm -hmm. at this point was fairy tales like you know the Grimm's brothers and Perot and you know many of the others okay. so uh my friends and I had you know late in the evening had these discussions about what we would do mm -hmm. so I started working on a game to be called the fairy tale adventure and that took me seven months I did the art the music the programming uh and as you can see I made this costume uh that was a character in the game mm -hmm. um and that game, I mean, it wasn't popular by today's standards, but it was extremely popular for its day, right? Wow. And even, even now, today, you know, um, 35 years later, mm -hmm. uh, I still get occasional letters saying, oh, fairy tale was the game I, I played as a child, right? And, and thank you so much for bringing <laughs> joy into my life. You know, I, I still get letters, you know? Wow. Uh, for this game, uh, which is amazing. Mm -hmm. The other interesting thing about Fairy Tale, it was the very first game to have an extremely large, seamless world, mm -hmm. which is pretty common today. Like if you play Elder Scrolls Skyrim, for example, you can just pick a direction and start walking. But back then, you, you know, the first computer games were like Ultima and, and Bard's Tale, where Whenever you went to a new area, the game would stop and you'd load, 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 and then you the you'd, the screen would be paused until you could go. Fairy Tale had a map that was 128 screens wide by 128 screens tall, mm -hmm. and you and there were no loads, there were no pauses, right? And so it was the first. I think it was the first game to be able to support a very huge world. Now. That being said, there was a downside, which is that that world was very repetitive, right? Mm. You know, one person can't create enough content to fill a world that large, yeah. right? Yeah. So that was one of the complaints that people noticed fairly early on. But still, it was a sweet little game that had a good heart to it, right? Mm -hmm. So... And oh, yes. Everything. And, and Apart from the logo. That's what you said when you showed me the, the game. Everything, you even act as one of the characters of the game. At the time, I was staying in a in a, a house. So, at the time, I belonged to the Los Angeles Fantasy uh, Science Fantasy Society, which was a, a club down in L.A. And um, I had met someone there who offered to let me stay in their back room, and I was paying, you know, like a hundred bucks a month or something really cheap, right? 
Uh, but they also had a lot of June bugs, right? These these little insects, mm-hmm. and they were all over the place. You know, even in the room I was staying. So I remember having to, you know, they were like a butterscotch colored beetles, right? And I remember having to scoop them off of the keyboard in the morning oh, when I wanted to work. No way! <laughs> that's <laughs> that's some crazy conditions to code. Yes, probably in, in uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I want to highlight w- what you said earlier um, on, on building a career versus just exploring what you're interested mm-hmm. in. I think that um, my generation is very focused, most of us at least, are very preoccupied with our career and very, um, yeah, preoccupied about how productive we are mm-hmm. and things like that because we're constantly harassed by content and social media about being productive and so on. And I, I, I love what you said about just being interested in how this path um, that might have not been super intentional. Right. Um, you were just fo- literally following what you were obsessed with and interested with uh, paid off. Joseph Campbell says, follow your bliss. Mm-hmm. I love Joseph Campbell. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. <laughs> yeah. Can you tell us about the Dreamers Guild? Yes. Okay. So after I finished Fairy Tale, and again, I made a, quite a bit of money off of Fairy Tale, mm-hmm. uh, but it was becoming increasingly clear. I did a couple other projects, Music X, Discovery 2, and some contract work for Commodore. Uh, and But by 1992, it was coming increasingly clear that we weren't getting a very good deal. Me and my friends, you know, uh, Wolf uh, McNally was one of the co-founders of the Dreamers Guild. So we got together and said, let's form our own company, right? Let's let's do it right, mm-hmm. right? We're tired of these these publishers and these these uh, development houses that are screwing us over. I, mean, I, was, I was getting like 2% royalties or something, mm-hmm. you know, ridiculous. Um, and we used to have these meetings at the Good Earth uh, restaurant down in Northridge, right? We'd sit around the table and talk about the kind of company we would want to build, right? So we, we founded the company. It was, it was first working out of a living room, uh, 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 Wolf's living room, Wolf and his brother Michael. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, and we would... <laughs> There was we would we would gather the, some of the best and uh, the people that we, we had, were friends with. There was a young kid uh, named Joe Burks who had showed uh, a sprite editor demo, and we just basically kidnapped him and, and just forced him to come into the company with us, right? <laughs> uh, uh, and so um, it started out as about a dozen uh, people, mm-hmm. and by the end of it, uh, it grew to over eighty employees before it went bankrupt and by that time we were working out of a um uh a light industrial space uh office space and things like that paying rent you know paying payroll taxes the whole thing it was a wonderful time we did some amazing things but we also made some really serious mistakes right we didn't know how to run a business right um for example one of the things that we were very egalitarian anybody who stayed with us for more than two years was on the board I read about that on the Wikipedia page. Um, open consensus-driven business model. Yes. <laughs> Tom, yes. I, I'm. I'm so curious. What was the aspiration with with the company in general and with this kind of business model? We we thought that you know we're inventing the future, right? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> So that should apply to everything, not just the games, right? It should apply to the way that run we run the business. Yeah. And 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 in some ways it. The, the loyalty that we got out of it was just amazing. People would do just the most amazing things to, to, to keep the company going, okay? Um, but we also made mistakes in, in trusting the wrong people. Uh, we also grew the company too fast. So, mm. so some of the people, one of the problems we had is that um, the talent that we got was kind of uneven, right? Some people were super performers and other people were hardly productive at all, right? Mm-hmm. Not that they didn't work hard, but just about everything that they did had to be thrown away and redone by someone else, right? Yeah. Because the because the quality wasn't there. And so we were getting late uh, on our contracts. And so uh, some of the more business people, people that had came in later that had more business experience said, well, we got to grow the company and get more business. Mm-hmm. But 
whereas Wolf and I really disagreed with that strategy, we we said, well, no, we need to we need to focus on quality so we can get these things done. Getting in more business is just going to make us go b- b- bankrupt faster if we keep losing money on every deal, mm-hmm. right? And so it was a sweatshop equity company with a lot of sweat and not a lot of equity, right? Mm-hmm. And so eventually, you know, we just couldn't continue. We couldn't pay the bills and we had to declare, declare bankruptcy. But um, if I known what I know now, I mean, we could have done so much better, but... Yeah. Uh, but it was wonderful. It was a, it was, it was quite a time and we did crazy stuff. I mean, you know, we had, of course, the usual, um, uh, what do you call, um, office chair wars, right? Where you roll around in office chairs and, and we had, you know, the, the classic Nerf, uh, uh, guns, you know, uh, Nerf wars, uh, oftentimes somebody would put on like, uh, uh, David Arkenstone or, or, uh, 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 you know, some some kind of new agey or electronic or rock music would be playing in the background. Uh, we had it was just a it was it was a whirlwind, right? Yeah. In many ways, yeah. Because can you can you give us an idea? Um, how old were you? Um, so let's see, the Dreamers Guild was nineteen eighty two. So I was about twenty five when I started, wow. and about thirty years old when I when when we when we finished. And that's that's a. That's quite a, a crazy time for California. Mm-hmm. Um, can you give us an idea of what it looked like to be in the middle of the hippie movement? Like all the all the things that were ha- like, I mean, new technologies, hippie movement. Well, the hippie movement was about 10 years before that. Yeah. Okay. And, uh-huh. But, um, but there was definitely a hacker movement, right? Mm. So one of the things that we did is that I used to go to a lot of science. Remember, I did costuming and science and art, right? And so I used to go to a lot of science fiction conventions. Mm-hmm. And at the time, my girlfriend was also an artist, um, and we knew a lot of other artists in the in that area. We uh, people who had done you know traditional painting, but science fiction themes, right? Mm. And so we decided to create a computer art party. So what we did is we took out we we. This was actually before, it started actually before uh, Dreamers Guild was founded. We, we took all the computers from Microillusions, mm-hmm. set them up on picnic tables in our house and invited all of our artist friends over for chips and salsa and, and sodas and snacks. And then we would sit them down and teach them how to use deluxe paint, wow. right? And they were just blown away. I mean, they, 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 uh, they started, I can paint on a computer. And some of those people, I think about four or five of them, actually start, ended up having careers in the video, in the computer game industry because of their introduction to being able to draw a computer at our parties. So, Wow. How did it feel like to go bankrupt with um, the Dreamers Guild? And what would you say you learned about this whole experience? Well, it was a very hard time for me. I had both... My, I had lost my company and I lost my girlfriend in the same month, right? Uh, and I was kind of in shock, right? I mean, I was feeling... It's the kind of depression where you're standing in the middle of a parking lot at night and the very air around you feels malevolent, mm-hmm. right? It's like, it's like the whole world seemed hostile, right? And And that was just me putting my spin on things, but... But I was really, I was burned out. I had been working sixteen hour days, right, mm-hmm. and and it had all come crashing down. And I had to recover. And the way I recovered is by getting another job, uh, game programming job. But but for a long time, I was hesitant to put my heart into anything, mm-hmm. right, to to keep a certain emotional distance. And that lasted for about ten years. What made you decide if that wasn't something? intentional to open your heart again to what you're working on and maybe life in general i was just afraid right i mean i was afraid of the hurt right Mm. uh uh and and eventually you know and and i was i was really i was depressed i was i was clinically depressed but i was undiagnosed for for a long time right i Mm. didn't want to go see a doctor uh there were times you know, riding on the, the trolley, for example, I'm looking out the window and seeing everything pass by and it just hurting, hurting, hurting. And, and it almost felt like I was drunk, you know, with and and part of me, there's a little part of it that said, you know, this would be pretty cool if it didn't hurt so much. Mm. Right. 
what was the way out of this? So for a while I was on antidepressants, uh, but they had side effects. Uh, I, I went through therapy. A lot of things happened, but I eventually recovered, right? I'm no longer taking antidepressants. I'm no longer taking therapy, but I haven't been depressed in a long time, right? Mm. And, and there are certain, you just learn to think differently, basically, right? You learn to catch yourself. When you get into that downward spiral, you start to think, oh, I'm getting into, this. it's emotional intelligence, right? You, you recognize, hey, that thing that happens is starting to happen again. You know, maybe you should like eat a sandwich. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Wow. Um, this makes me think of um, the one of the things we talked about when we first met that is nonviolent communication. Yes. And that's a tool that also, I mean, I, so I'm curious to know for you, but in my experience was life changing. And one of those tools that really saved me in developing my emotional intelligence. Absolutely. And that and Human Awareness Institute. So tell us more about what is nonviolent communication and Human Awareness Institute in your own world and what it changed yes. in, your, in your life. So surprisingly, I learned about these things at the Hackers Conference. Wow. Okay. Okay. <laughs> uh, there, was, there, was a, there was a panel called Hacking... Uh, hacking intimacy and hacking emotions, right? Mm. Right. That, that basically taking the sort of the hacker mentality and applying it to social contact, right? Yeah. And so, and and the lesson that I got out of that panel, and I decided to follow up on, was that, you know, a lot of people have poor social skills. I had poor social skills, and people think, well, you'll just grow out of it. No, you won't grow out of it by yourself, right? You, you, you. It's not most people learn it instinctively but some people have to be taught mm. right and so when i learned about nonviolent communication i went to the um uh the, the the classes and the classes you know any they they charge you whatever you can you know if you can't afford you can get in right mm -hmm. uh and i was lucky to see a class by the founder of uh nonviolent communication uh uh, uh marshall rosenberg mm -hmm. right who is on the, on the sense that it appeals to my sort of scientific, you know, in the sense that he's a psychologist, he, he studies. At the same time, he's a very sweet gentleman. I mean, he's, he's passed away now, but uh, he would talk about the techniques of nonviolent communication. And then he'd play his guitar and then he'd talk a little bit about the techniques and then he'd put on a little puppet show. Uh, uh, you know, he had like puppets of a, a giraffe and a jackal representing the the, um, the, 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 the compassionate heart and the judgmental heart. Mm. And it was like the jackal would go, nobody loves me. And the giraffe would say, well, that's why. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so so the, the key idea of uh, nonviolent communication is that there's a language of compassion and a language of judgment, right? There are different ways of, of different, when you speak, there are different ways or aspects of communication that can be emphasized. And a lot of times we want to be compassionate. We want to, you know, support the person, but that comes out in a way that sounds judgmental, right? That sounds like we're criticizing. And because our vocabularies, our emotional vocabularies are so poor that we can't help it. And so the idea of nonviolent communication, nonviolent communication is to teach us a vocabulary, it teaches a way of speaking so that we can convey our compassion without triggering a defensive reaction in the listener, which I thought was made a lot of sense. It's not like woo woo, new agey stuff, right? Yeah. I mean, it's very practical, right? It's very, very grounded. And I like that about it, right? So uh, I learned it. I went to a couple more classes. I started to internalize it and it really helped. The other, the other uh, workshop, Human Awareness Institute, is uh, intimacy workshops. So now one of the things about uh, HII is you're not really supposed to talk too much about what goes on uh, during the workshop because some of it's based on surprise. Mm. But I can tell you that it creates a safe, it's a weekend retreat, usually like in a remote location with a forest and a beautiful, maybe hot tubs or something, you know. And then uh, a lot of it happens at Harbin Hot Springs. If you've ever been to Harbin Hot Springs up in, uh, oh, you should go. Yeah. All right. <laughs> Right. So, so, um, but it creates a safe space and a set of exercises. Also, let me explain about the importance of structure. 
a lot of us don't know where to begin, right? And if you say, please begin, it's like there's this nervousness, this anxiety is like, I don't know what to do. But if there's a program to follow, if there's a set of instructions, then you're off the hook. Now, all I have to do is follow the program. All I have to do is, you know, go along with the, with the facilitator, right? So, so Human Awareness Institute creates a physical safe space where you can exercise your intimacy, right? In ways that is safe, right? And, and, and learn to sort of break through some of those anxieties and some of those, and they have multiple levels. You have to do level one before you can do level two, level two, and it goes up to like level nine, right? Mm -hmm. So, so I highly recommend Human Awareness Institute again. And it's, it's, it's much more direct than nonviolent communication. Nonviolent communication is very verbal and very, um, mm -hmm. Uh, very uh, uh, cerebral in some ways, right? It's emotional, but it's also cerebral. Human awareness is much more physical in its mm. in its approach, right? It's it's about the body, yeah. right? And so and so, yes, it's definitely something I recommend. Mm. Yeah, wonderful tools that, um, in my experience too, as I as I said, uh, were life changing and allowed me also these self reflective habits that you talked earlier when you find yourself in a negative loop mm -hmm. or in a dark pattern allows you to realize what's going on in your mind yes. and get out of it, yes. um, which is very, very powerful. It also helps to have hope, mm. right? To have a, a, an actual plan. If, if you think that nothing is ever going to get better, I mean, in some ways that's a reinforcing signal. I like to think that Memories, imagine your memories as a, like a deck of index cards, which each memory on a card, right? Mm -hmm. And you can arrange those cards in different ways. You can arrange those cards in a way that tells a happy story. You can also arrange those cards in a way that tells a terrible, depressing story. Mm -hmm. And the problem is that the more intelligent and introspective you are, the better you are at arranging those cards, yeah. right? And so you can come up with a terrible story, you know, by thinking it, you know, really overthinking it. And so... You need a guiding star. You need something that you can look to as a as a as a way to a path, mm. right? Right. It's not just you're just living your life and then you're just going through the motions and, mm. and the same old same old, right? And it's meaningless, there is exactly. no purpose. Exactly. Uh -huh. How do you cultivate hope and how do you cultivate meaning and purpose? Yeah, I mean, it's gonna be different for everybody. <laughs> Your way. Well, part of it, I'm an optimist about the future, right? Mm. Uh, I believe the closest thing I have to a religion is the United Federation of Planets. Okay. What, uh, what uh, is that? Well, the, the, that's that's Star Trek, right? In Star mm. Trek, the, oh. <laughs> the government right. is, you know, like a utopia. You yeah. got, and, and part of the, the theme of Star Trek is... You know, it's a violent, dangerous universe. How do you maintain your utopian ideals? But I don't literally believe that Star Trek's going to happen, right? Mm -hmm. But I do believe that humanity has the potential in it, not the certainty. It's, we, may, we may screw it up. We may destroy ourselves. But humanity has the potential to create something better than what we have now. Mm. Okay? And so that, that's my faith. Yeah. Okay? What, what's a version of the future that you have hope in, you're excited about, that makes you happy to think of on a few topics that are in, in your mind? Oh, man. Well, I'm, these days, you know, I'm very into politics, right? And, which I don't really want to talk about in, the, in this podcast, but um, I, I'm interested in social institutions, right? And one of the things that I'm fascinated about the idea is pro-social, right? The pro-social, um, what can we learn about putting humans together? Because if you just throw humans on an island, right? It's Lord of the Flies, right? It's, it's terrible, right? Uh, and this is something that the people who made Facebook and Twitter didn't really understand. You know, Mark Zuckerberg thinks that, oh, if we just put all of humanity together, if we just you know, by, if we just bring people together, it's going to create this beautiful heaven on earth. No, that's wrong. That's completely <laughs> wrong. Okay. Uh, people suck, right? Mm -hmm. But what makes people not suck is having accountability, right? Is having 
uh, a framework that that can uh, establish, you know, good behavior, right, and incentivize that behavior, right. Uh, otherwise, you get, you know, a, a dystopian nightmare, right. So, so, and some of that is culture, and some of that is design, right. Um, um, the culture, culture, especially if for for engineering people, tend to us underestimate you know, the influence of culture, right? They tend to think of everything in technocratic terms, right? If it's, it's the, the U.S. Constitution is like some kind of operating system, you know, where, yeah. where you, you run programs, right? Well, Liberia was a nation founded based on cloning the U.S. Constitution, and that didn't last very long at all, and it turned into a nasty dictatorship, right? And so, so you know, uh, America has lasted as long as it has because... Thus, the individual states were already had a tradition of democracy and free speech, even before the Constitution was written. Uh, so anyway, I don't want to get too much into that, but but uh, OK. Let's conclude this whole conversation. I, I kind of want to to take the conversation back to what you said at the very beginning when you explained that as a child, you were interested by lots of things and you didn't want to choose because it didn't feel right to choose. That's and, right. Um, and as I read some some pieces of, of, of writing about you, I, I read that you're an artist, that you're a musician, you're an incredible programmer. And so I wonder, um, you also mentored a lot of young people before and that's that question is for young people specifically. What would you recommend or what are some thoughts you'd like to share uh, to young people interested in lots of things and super lost about their path because they feel like they don't fit in the way we think of a path? Right. The question of focus. I mean, in some ways, the people who told me to focus on one thing were right in the sense that you have to focus on something long enough to get good at it. They say that it takes 5,000 hours to get good at anything, right? And, and it's, it's usually easier to get good at something if it's something that you really enjoy, right? Because you'll naturally spend time doing it. But that doesn't necessarily mean you have to give up everything else, right? Um, but you, have to, you do have to commit, right? And, and I've gotten better at that. You know, as I've, as I've aged, I've learned ways of keeping myself motivated you know, and keeping myself um, focused, right? That I, that I didn't know when I was young, right? Um, one of my tricks, for example, I noticed that um, if I brag about my ideas too much, I lose the motivation to do them, right? So if I have some like project that I want to do, and if I tell too many people about it, well, I've already gotten all the positive strokes, right? Yeah. All the all the good feedback. Now I don't need to do the project anymore, right? So so I've learned to keep it under wraps, right? To, to, to actually keep what I'm doing confidential, maybe share it with a few people, but not, not tell the world what I'm working on, mm -hmm. right? Uh, and that helps, helps keep my motivation level up. Now it's gonna be different for everybody, right? But, but you, you, learn to, you eventually learn to know yourself, right? You, you learn to know what works for you and what doesn't, but you have to be ob observing, right? You have to know that hey, I'm not like other people, right? I'm not the same as her or the same him. Each of us is going to have a different strategy, right? And so we have to, over time, learn what those strategies are. Wonderful. Thank you so much for opening up. Hey, thank you. It was my pleasure. This was fun. Yeah, all the stories. Great. I hope you leave this conversation energized and inspired by Tallinn's words. Make sure to subscribe to the podcast on your favorite platform for new episodes every week and to follow me at Zelda Poem for more content on how to navigate life as a young renegade.